We're on the last panel of the day, which is about investments. Uh, and I guess this is what's uh, on everyone's mind, either because there's about 30 billion to be traded, or there's 60 billion of NPLs, which will lead to some secondary transactions. So the question is, uh, when will this come to the market? In what shape or form? Pricing, what investors want, and so on. Will it be securitization? Would be uh, loan sales, and so, and so on. So to lead this discussion, we've got Jose Manuel Gasalla from Oliver Wyman. Welcome from Spain, and Thank the floor you. is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's start, if you may, with a round of introductions with all of you. I'll, I'll do a quick introduction of, of all our panelists. And uh, as you'll see, there's a diverse set of us uh, in this space, so we will hopefully have uh, complementary views on, on, on the topics that that we're going to bring, I think, I think it's going to be an interesting discussion. Um, we have Akis with us. Akis is the managing director of Intram Investments here in Greece, and he has been involved in multiple securitizations over the last uh, months after after he, he in 2019 uh, became part of the team post the carve out of our view from from Piraeus Bank. Um, we've got Victor. Victor leads the investment strategy in NPLs and NPLs and REOs for Devo Capital in Europe. Um, and he's led over 85 transactions in, in, in this space recently. We've got Johannes, he's the managing director of, of Lynx Capital and, and he leads acquisitions and transactions of NPL portfolios across Europe. And we've got Victor who lead, works in APS and, and, and leads the investment team uh, from Bratislava and, and he manages acquisitions in all the markets in which APS is, is involved. Um, and, and I'm Jose Gazzai, I'm a partner in, in Oliver Wyman and I, and I work in this, in, in this space all across Europe. Um, um, so hopefully we can have an interesting discussion on the topic. Um, let me start with, with a couple of topics and, and, and probably I'll just uh, ask it to the group and, and we can all complement and, and, and add our views. Um, the, the first one on, on how transactions are happening, we, we've, most of us have been involved in this half securitizations that have been happening in the market and are still happening. One question to the group, and, and, and maybe Akis, uh, you've been very close to this space, so maybe maybe you can you can start. What, what, what do you think is going to happen on on secondary trades? Secondary trades emerging from from the half securitizations. Sure. Hi. Good afternoon. Good evening to everyone. Um, it's been quite a busy few years, right? And uh, and of course, the last couple of years have been quite busy on half, sec half securitization transactions. Uh, I would say that it's, uh, it, this has been uh, quite a success story, I would say, from a uh, you know, uh, Greek perspective. Uh, there have been many um, participants in the process. Of course, the banks were the first ones to, to engage into it, important, very important, and of course, investors. Uh, and um, eventually, what this will generate over time uh, and I would say that as definitely as soon as 2022 and, and, and beyond, is that uh, there will be portfolio sales coming from these securitization transactions. This will come in, it will, it will, they will, this will come in, in two different shapes, uh, if you will. One, it's going to be on um, restructured accounts. Uh, many of the banks who have uh, sold uh, or have securitized uh, these portfolios um, are looking towards to rebind back um, portfolios with customers who have been performing well. Hence, the servicers today are managing these portfolios. They are trying to restructure the loans, uh, get a good payment behavior by customers. And uh, once you go over a 12-month threshold, that's when these accounts start to uh, become reforming, <clears throat> and therefore, once they start to become reforming, that is that, that is where the interest of the banks uh, comes into play. Uh, banks will be interested in buying them back. Of course, uh, it would help from a balance sheet perspective the banks, but it would also help in cultivating a new customer relationship in order to give more loans eventually in the future to these customers. So that is that is the one the one tranche. And of course, not only, not only systemic banks or banks in general, not only the systemic banks, but banks in general are interested in these types of assets, but also other uh, investors, banking investors, um, are also interested in these type of trades as well. Thereafter, there are the more of the portfolio sales of 
the same NPLs, right? Um, or real portfolio sales as well. So NPL portfolio sales and real portfolio sales, because these NPLs will eventually um, generate, uh, you know, the services will come to market with, you know, specific segmentations of uh, assets. Um, and they will um, uh, sell those assets uh, in smaller tranches, that is, of course. Um, uh, even single tickets in some cases as well. Uh, so that will also take place, and that's what we expect anyways. Uh, but given that these HEP securitization transactions also uh, are secured portfolios that contain collaterals, these collaterals eventually will born RIOs that will come to uh, the ownership of Rioco companies. These companies will also look to sell the RIOs on an individual basis, but also potentially on a portfolio basis as well. So a lot will be happening in that, in that, in that sense from these HAP securitization transactions as far as the secondary market is concerned. So a lot of activity, uh, I, you know, I expect a lot of that to be happening in the next couple of years or so. We're seeing a lot of that and, and it's going to be interesting the, the dynamics, right? Because all those securitizations come with, with significant payments on, on the senior tranches. So, so probably everyone looking into how to make sure all those targets are well achieved and everyone is on the safe side. Yes. As investors, so opening it to, to the rest of our panel, what are your views, what are your things on, on secondary deals? Do you think there's going to be a lot of them recently in, or in the next few months? Do you think that's going to be happening more in the reperforming space a little bit later down the road? How are you seeing the space here? Uh, well, I, I mean, I think we have multiple investors in the in the room. If I may pick it up, uh, look, I mean, HAPS transactions have been a huge success for, for banks. I guess more, more for banks than for buyers. But, uh, uh, and the, it had a, had a dynamic. I mean, uh, the, 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 late, uh, the last one was basically the first one, I mean, uh, done by MBG, or being done by MBG, was the first one without the service or in the mix. Hence, the, the structure was a little bit more uh, comforting for investors, and business plan was a little bit more uh, kind of closer to be achievable, but any of the tra of the of the pricings of of of, um, of the hubs, um, basically B notes and B coupons, pretty much, have had to involve some thinking of of, of say how to keep the business plan uh, you know close to performing, how to kind of remedy and what actions to take, and and I mean there, there's not much to be done. Um, which is outside of the of, of the which is within the hands of, of the of the of the investor. So everyone is planning um, ARIO sales you know, once the the, the Rio cost ramp up. And as Aki's rightly pointed, I mean, 90 plus percent of the of all the liquidation strategies, especially in retail, ends up with with, with Rio Co. Hence, Rio needs to sell to uh, to deplete the uh, the cash flows and so on. Also, so that this is priced in and pretty much expected. Same for the for the MPL sales, but the, the restrictions are a bit uh, more prudent uh, by the by basically the, the the kind of contractual arrangements. But still, uh, market shall expect uh, secondary trades coming out. And the big big thing is the performers. I mean that that's this is something which I believe the banks uh, in in Greece or you, know, you can see it in the other markets are hungry for for good products. Hence. Um, uh, sale of or, or transfer of, of, of re-performing customers, although uh, it will take uh, you know 12 plus months to, to kind of build up the history, uh, this will also take place. So I mean, it was a great tool. It is a great tool to to, to move the uh, the portfolios out of the bank's balance sheets at the price which are affordable, and then you know create a, a flow uh, to come. Absolutely, I think. I think it's incredible to see the change in the balance sheet of the banks over, over 24 months, right? Um, with almost everyone going down to single-digit NPL ratios in, in Greece. That was, that was unthinkable of before, before we had that tool. Um, we, we've touched on, on two interesting topics. We've touched on the re-performing side of, of the world, right? What, what will happen with all those loans that are, are going to be restructured? Um, I have one question that leads to that one, which is, 
you've all probably been close and involved with, with looking at the business plans, what, 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 what's inside those transactions and securitizations, and, and you've seen the level, the percentages of, of loans that are expected to restructure versus those that are expected to be liquidated, right? There is, there's going to be a, an interesting balance of, of what is actually feasible versus what is actually uh, done by, by the owners of the securitizations. Um, uh, Johannes, what's your view as, as an investor on, on how are those business plans, what's the view of restructurings versus liquidations that is coming to the market? Is that realistic? Is, this, is your view slightly different to that one? How, how, how do you think that the market will actually be, be able to, to, to operate? That's a very good question. I think the um, answer will lie in the middle. I think there will be a mix in the end. That for some, the restructuring, for some, the early liquidations, etc. Um, we touched on an interesting point earlier that the, the schemes were very successful before, but maybe more successful for the sellers than for the buyers, right? And especially now with the um, pandemic, basically, I think many of the asset managers, they got a little bit of a reality check on, the, on their initial business plans that they uh, underwrote to. And here we will just need to see what how they are responding to that. Because obviously for some of them, an early large amount of cash inflow will be helpful to maintain their projections, etc. And for others, well, it will be, the, the restructuring will, will be important. And this is where I think it's, 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 it's going to be very interesting, especially on the secondary market, because I believe there will be a lot of um, movement. And again, people, I think also now um, gained much more experience over the last couple of years. Because when did it all start? If I'm not mistaken, I think the first portfolio was sold and traded in the end of 2017. And ever since we have like four years almost of experience, of course there is a little bit of the little bit. There was a long time of Corona in between, but still there was enough time before that people could actually, you know, gain that experience and see how long it takes, etc. And I think that will all yeah, flow into that assessment and then we will, we will, we will, we will see a lot of activity. Understood. Um, Victor, uh, follow on for you. You've been participating in the market as, as fr from the APA side and the balance sheet. Um, how are you looking into what is more attractive for, for someone like, like APS when they look into loans? Or is the restructuring side of the world or is the liquidation side of the world? I know there's a balance, right? It's not, yeah. that, it's not that you'll probably be looking into both worlds, but, but where do you think from your perspective, you, you as an investor linked to, to, to the capability to, to restructure and to, and to do the servicing, where, where do you find it more interesting in the market? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, when it comes to secondaries, in, in, uh, from, from the perspective of secondaries, I think there will be opportunities, but it's, it's going to be a factor of what is, uh, you know, what the seller can afford in the end of the day, right? How those business plans were, were created, how the curves were shaped, how long those are, and um, it's not too different from a direct sale. It's just a different counterpart is entering the, 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 the negotiation. So you need the same type of ingredients. Uh, if you ask me, like for, from the perspective of, of, of an investor, you know, we are welcoming both situations, you know, with uh, kind of longer repayment plans where you achieve higher returns. That makes sense. And it's a good mix and a good component for a, a liquidation type of strategy. So you can combine more steady cash flows from perspective of your portfolio with more bumpier liquidation of, of, of the stock that you have bought. So uh, from that perspective, I think both options are, are on the table. Um, whether the securitization will be more kind of, uh, you know, restructurings and uh, or, you know, um, and longer curves, or it's going to be more of a question of, of sudden larger lump sum payments. I don't know. It's uh, something that um, it, it, it's all, for, from my perspective, it's, I think, uh, what the business plans will allow in the end of the day, right? 
Yeah, I think you touched on a very important part when you said, like, what can the seller actually afford? Because that's going to be very interesting to see. I look at it a little bit from the banks. They were forced to take the provisions, right, because of regulated entities. And that obviously made it easier for the investors to step in because there was a certain provision level established. And for the sellers now, are we sure that they always were, like, let's say, Obviously, they, they know the numbers, right? But did they really account for everything? And will the, on the secondary market, the trades actually reach their expectations? That's going to be interesting to see compared, because obviously they have less pressure to take internal provisions, um, depending on if they are regular, listed or not listed, etc. That, that will be very interesting. Yeah. And on the topic of reperforming, I mean, I would love to see uh, you know, bigger chunks of stuff being re uh, getting to uh, areas of re-performing, but to be honest, the portfolios that are being traded are not that type of, right? You have a mix of also cases where you can expect certain level of uh, re-performing and uh, rebouncing back to, to a more PL areas, but these are MPLs, uh, you know, DPDs are longer, you know, expectations are limited. And it's, it's going to be an interesting part where the banks can take over those cases, but compared to the rest of the book, I think it's going to be like, uh, um, I would ex expect, right, uh, Max has got a probably better uh, overview, uh, or I would assume that that's going to be a smaller component of, of, the, you know, of the whole solution. When, when you look into all the securitizations and you, and you look, you aggregate them, right, and you, you look into those business plans and you look into what percentage is being structured as a, as a restructured, right? So it's, it's being segmented as a restructuring and what the level of default historically has been. You look at numbers that look into, depending on the ranges that you use, 10 to 20 billion of, of exposure that will be restructured or that the business plan suggests that will be restructured, right? That we'll have to see if that actually materializes, right? But that's the, the expectation from the business plans. Um, we, we already touched upon it, and, and that's only a portion of, of, the, of the full set of securitization. So, uh, so agree, it won't, be, it won't be all of it or a majority of it, but still it will, if those numbers hold, it will be a significant chunk uh, to come to market. Um, are you seeing banks uh, in, in the position or in the appetite or in the conversations of, of looking at? Are you seeing other investors that are interested uh, in, in, in joining this space, right, on, on, on participating in the acquisition of, of, of re-performing assets? Akis and, and probably Victor, both that are closer to the servicing world, maybe maybe you, you have views. Have you, have you had those discussions with, with the banks? Are they interested in that? set of re-performing mortgages that might come to the market in the next 18 months? Absolutely. I mean, banks have expressed, and, and, and once they got into the um, area of securitizing under the HAPS legislation, uh, it was always also in their back of their mind that they will, able, will be able to eventually acquire assets from these securitization transactions. Uh, I do agree that uh, it's not going to be the larger portion, it's going to be a minor portion, as you were mentioning earlier, Victor. Um, <clears throat> but uh, but it's always, it was always there, uh, I would say, that as part of the, the, you know, the original plan, because that is something that they look forward to uh, in order to buy those accounts, again, help out their balances, but also at the same time be able to cultivate customer relationships for future lending as well. So that's, uh, the banks are very much uh, interested in that. Um, of course, these securitization transactions also, as they have to get um, uh, um, approval, SRT approval by the SSM, the SSM has certain restrictions on the banks uh, as to whether they can buy from the, their own portfolios that they have securitized. So in some cases, there will be those restrictions, uh, maybe not in all cases. But that means that one bank that has securitized from its own portfolio, it will not be able to buy from that same portfolio, but it will have to buy from another portfolio from another bank that has securitized. So there's certainly bank interest in, from that perspective. Uh, um, and with respect to investors buying, 
Um, uh, I, would I would say that uh, the investors are more still looking in the MPL space, buying portfolios from these uh, transactions, HAP securitization transactions that are more NPLs or reals, uh, and not so much reperforming. Uh, you know, that is, uh, you know, the, the bank, uh, I think, will eventually pay, you know, a premium for those versus, say, an NPL investor or another type of investor that might be looking at uh, reperforming accounts. There's certainly a, a bigger interest from the bank to, to buy those. Um, so, yeah, I, I, that, that, that's, that's the way I see that it's going to play out, basically. Yes, we, th those limitations from, from the regulator to, I, I think there are two, right? On the, on the SRT side, it, it, depending on how long it was restructured, it would come back in as an NPL or not. So there, there's going to be some timing between, between when those loans are restructured and when actually banks are able to, to buy them back in a, in a provision efficient way, right? Uh, and there's the, that, other, that other point that you were mentioning uh, of, of banks being limited from buying back from, from their own uh, securitizations. Um, I, I agree, I think that will generate an ecosystem that's, that's to be created. Mm -hmm. um, an example that comes to mind is the Irish reperforming market in which, in which um, probably some years ago, ahead of, uh, ahead of where we are now, we're able to build that ecosystem. Is that something that is we will we see different different investors coming into that space right they're they're lower yields they're they look closer to insurance companies than than npl investors right that the yields are different but we've also seen a lot of structuring around those deals and and, and that's a place where the combination of distress investors and 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 let's say more investors in the performing space can, can sort of collaborate have you been exploring that is that something that you think could happen in greece and could create that market in the future, maybe. Well, happy, yeah. happy to pick it up. I mean, uh, we're actually looking at, at, at Irish situations of, of, uh, of a combination of um, re-performing and, and non-performing. I mean, it's being sold as a, as a package. Now, Ireland has a, has a different uh, kind of a uh, wave of, of, of deals now, given the consolidation of the market yeah. and other, other trends. But especially in the PDH, in the, in the, in the mortgages, uh, you see now a large trades coming out as a combination of, of re-performing and non-performing. You've got, I mean, you absolutely pointed rightly that, that there are different types of investors. Some of them even cannot, cannot touch both. You have, you've got, I mean, now um, many of the large players um, got a, a, um, a public side in, in the part of the balance sheet. So the public team cannot touch the private uh, thing. So they cannot work together. I mean, I, I wouldn't ma uh, name physically the, the investor, but one of the largest investors uh, in the world. They can do both, but not together, not jointly in, as, as one team. So in different type of consortia, different type of, um, of, um, of pricing dynamics um, is um, in these structures achievable, and that, that's, that, that, that might be, well, the case of Greece. I mean, Greece has a, has a uh, I mean, great securitization um, environment and the, the, the ecosystem. I mean, not all of the, all of the uh, re-performing loans as they are meant to be re-performing uh, from, uh, from the seller's perspective would be re-performing, so they would have to kind of uh, uh, package it and, and, and attract different investors. So it, it very well can, um, can create a nice market. Also in Ireland, there, 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 there were a couple of secondary sales, quite successful mm -hmm. on both ends, re-performing and, and, and non-performing. So that, that, that can very well happen. What is the interesting part, just switching gears to the corporate side. I mean, uh, uh, we didn't touch it yet, but uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the hubs business plans, the same thing for Italy, for GAX. I mean, you see a lot of re-performing plays on a corporate end with a, you know, huge bullets at the end. So if those are being sold, I mean, it's going to be either a re-restructuring or basically a liquidation. Because obviously, when the business plan was, was initially um, structured, it was to support the, the combination of senior and junior or mezzanine. But once the, uh, the structure sells it to gain, you know, uh, on the business plan end and on the cash end, they, 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 they've never counted with the, uh, with, with the bullet at the end. So the, the sale allows for, for a different strategy, either a new re restructuring with a more achievable target or just simply a liquidation, which is not a bad thing. It just brings, the, you know, brings assets to, to a new life and new, new pricing. On, on the corporate side, we've, we've seen movements, places where in Spain, for example, in which uh, 
not as successfully as intended, right? But in which some of those cases came into a um, equity style ownership, right? In which the, the second die trial ended in, in more specialized firms with more private equity um, capabilities trying to, to restructure operationally those companies and, and gain control of them. Um, probably harder here in Greece, right? Because, because the long prolonged crisis, who, who, who is in that stage is either either alive and will survive or, or probably in a, in a situation in which liquidation looks like the, looks like the scenario. But do you think that, and, and, and we didn't touch on this, but, but do you think that COVID will change any of those dynamics as on some of the companies that might actually be affected over leveraged and, and, and need some of that change in their balance sheet and maybe investors can, can come in in, in the wholesale space? If, if, I would think so, and, and that, that, that even well may create another wave of, of, of hubs. Okay. Because again, it's, it's, it's super hard for, for a bank to, to sell without being hit, uh, you know, to sell on a, on a normal uh, plan vanilla deal. Yes. But I, I'm not aware of, of, of the quantum of uh, what was under moratoria, what, what, you know, what basically is assumed to need to... I think we're, we're all waiting to see uh, when, when the liquidity that was very useful and well injected uh, might come to an end what, what, the, what the aftermath of, of, of the impact is. Let's, I think for that one we're, we're all going to have to wait. Mm -hmm. um, um, a couple of topics that we, we alluded and, and, and we, we mentioned the Ryokos, right? Um, um, what, what, when I look into the Ryoko space, I, I, I tend to look into my home country. We, we experienced this uh, extreme increase in, in real estate. At, at some point, uh, we didn't have the securitizations, but at some point, banks started to look like, like uh, real estate houses rather, rather than banks. Some of them still do. Um, how, how do you think Greece is going gonna, is gonna to be able to absorb the Ryoko? Probably probably for Akis or Victor, because you're closer yep. to, the, to the servicing space. So I would maybe start from you know, different markets, what we see where you know, within the lifetime of the MPL resolution as a country as such is maybe a bit more developed in a smaller scale, like in, in Croatia or other countries, where we see exactly these, these strategies are coming more and more uh, uh, you know, important in the days of when the real estate market price is, is increasing constantly. And you have you know, a slower pace of resolution of, of the cases if the pricing was, for example, not correct. You can still achieve very good uh, results by reprocessing those assets to a recourse. The only aspect of this is that, yes, it sounds very good. It's probably a, lo a bit longer timing, but it also you need to be ready, as in the previous discussion panels were discussing, discussing that you need to be ready infrastructure-wise, not only to onboard, but to service, to be ready put in additional capexes and you know, maintain, then market them, uh, and so forth. So I think that this will be, when looking at where Greece and MPL market is at the moment versus other countries, we see a trend towards recourse, that it's go going to be a more, more important um, uh, component, component of, the, of the recovery mix uh, of you know, a servicer uh, is applying to the portfolio. Visa together with, of course, the investors that are you know, supporting this. So it's going to be, I think, definitely one of the uh, more important strategies going forward. You know, once you, uh, you use up all the resources that you, you had and all the tools that you had initially prepared, you need to you know, resolve to cases where you can um, achieve higher returns than, than the current situation. And you already know what you've been already trying to do, right? So. I fully agree with that. Uh, real costs and the repossession of portfolios will be important, but it's uh, an aspect that it brings another layer of complexity that needs to be handled, and everybody knows about those, right? It's nothing new, uh, but the trend is clear from me, and also when I look at, I said, other, other jurisdictions, it's, uh, I think it's confirmed. Yeah, maybe if I can add to what Victor said, it's. Um you know, it all starts from the, the waterfall itself, right? And, and the reserves that are maintained within the waterfall so that the Ryokos can go out and, uh, and buy, right? So there's a liquidation strategy, and then from the liquidation strategy, there will be auctions. From the auctions, there has to be a company that has to go and buy. So it's either, from our perspective, it's either 
a third party, which is always a good solution if it's a third party that buys. If not, um, <clears throat> then it's going to have to be the Ryoko that buys in order to help facilitate the execution of the strategy. Um, with respect to, to, you know, to the past, you know, most of the banks were buying their own assets. So, uh, you know, 90% uh, of the sales that were, you know, or the acquisitions that were coming out from auctions were the, the same banks buying, you know, those, those collaterals. Um, that is now tipping a little bit further away from this 90-10 this split. Uh, which is good, it's good news, but it's not ever going to get to the point to where, you know, 100% of the Ryokos are purchased by third parties and not the Ryokos themselves, or the Israel sales. So, um, so it all starts from available liquidity in the waterfall in order to, for the liquidation strategy to be, to be executed and for eventually for, uh, you know, Rio, Rios to go out to the market. And then when Rios go out to the market, at the end of the day, I don't think it's a, it's just a simple, say, uh, formula of uh, supply, demand, and price, you know. Uh, that is certainly one aspect of it, right, which is, the, you know, certainly a big aspect of it. But it's also the infrastructure of the market as well. Um, because once you bid to buy a property, then, you know, for that property to become your property, it takes some time, right? So there is the lawyers, notary public, courts, whatever, civil servants that are in the, in the middle of all of this, right? And how long does that take to materialize, to take over the property? And, and, and when you put pressure into the system by mass volume, that might create issues, right? So, so how, is, how efficient is that? It's, it's, it's important. So how, is the, how efficient is the infrastructure in the market? So it's obviously very important. And, and once you take over the property, obviously you have to mature the property. So you also have to have in the marketplace, uh, you know, providers that will help you mature the property so that you can make it commercial and eventually sell it. So once you put, you know, you pipe a lot of volume into the system that will create, you know, it will create um, issues if the system is not efficient enough. So that is something that I will think, you know, will create uh, potentially some issues in the future. Uh, so that is something that we, you know, we, ha we, we look forward to trying to improve the efficiency in the infrastructure so that from bid to all the way to the sale of the Rio, you know, the, the process is as efficient as possible in order for, you know, to, kind, to, cut, you know, to cut down the, the, the processing time in between. That, that's, that's key. That's, I think that's more important for me than the, say, supply, demand, price equation. Uh, the latter is, is much more important. Yeah, I would just like to add what, exactly what Aki said and also Victor before, because on your question on this absorption, I think one of the key questions will actually be like timing and also funding, like the structuring for it, because I think people learned that the timing is longer than what they expected. Most of the business plans were most probably a little bit challenging on this end, so you need to have more time. But also when you basically develop the business plan and the asset or the underlying collateral turns into uh, Rio or Rio Co, etc., I mean the nature of the investment changes. And it's like, it's, it's crucial that I think the investor has the ability to hold the asset and not to be too much pressure, exactly what Aki said, like because there's a supply and demand thing, but if you, let's say, undervote a case as an NPL case with a certain, which has a certain return requirement, etc., you need to justify to your um, investor, to your committees, etc., but the moment that asset turns, basically, and flips and you want to hold it, it is a different nature, and basically you should not have the same funding on the, on the, on the same asset, which used to be an NPL, which is now a Rio. That's, for example, we approach this specific topic by actually setting up an independent Rio fund at the same time, where we can actually switch assets between, it, be, between each other. But I think that will, will be very important going forward, especially when absorption time for all the huge quantity of, of assets coming to the market will, will, yeah, will, will, will play all. I, I, maybe just to add, I mean, there, there's no way this quantity of assets can come to market, to a retail market. It needs to be a, another, another uh, kind of a wave of, of, of uh, REO portfolios trading. And that's exactly to, to the point that uh, it requires a, a different business plan, where longer, more patient money, it's, it's basically it's a macro play on Greece, which, you know, uh, 
people can take view uh, if it's a good play or not. But this, I mean, in my view, it's, it's inevitable that, that the that the areas uh, are traded as, as portfolios, at least to uh, to some extent. But but to an extent, of course, it depends on the type of the asset, right? Of what real estate is it? Is it like a, an empty factory, or is it like an office building that's occupied and it's actually yielding something and that as, as because it needs to be reflected in the business plan because obviously you are facing completely different questions the moment you are an owner you need to maintain the buildings you need to run this and to do all of this under an NPL assumption I find highly critical so there needs to be a either a different investor taking it or you need to have the systems ready to, to switch you know it's very, very simple comparison, right? You can have uh, a claim on your books and doesn't need you anything to do with that. There's this an property where the, I don't know, plaster is falling down or you need to cut the, cut the grass. It's a completely different uh, type of asset that you need to also have, first of all, as, as, as rightly said, the cash flow somehow cater for that uh, type of uh, uh, cost there, but also the investor needs to be and knowledgeable and understand that it's not going to, uh, you know, behave sort of like an, like an MPL. It's, it's a real estate. So you need to completely change your mind, right? You achieve probably uh, a better, better returns by owning asset and, you know, a bit, uh, you know, working with the asset in order to sell it at the, at the market as a clean asset, as a nice asset, right? And uh, there is the aspect of, of putting it on the market at the right time, at the right amount. On, on the larger scales for the entire country, but in the end, it pro most probably requires a different type of also mindset looking at it. Yeah. Just think about the fact that like you had, as you just said, you had an NPL claim and you had a topic and all of a sudden this becomes a real and next month you need to send an invoice to your tenant to pay the rent, yeah. which <laughs> maybe the systems are even not uh, uh, equipped for it, etc. It becomes a whole different, yeah. different game, so. No, uh, absolutely, I, I'm gonna follow up on that. Uh, um, I personally think that the capital of a lower yield will come for the REOs. I think, I, think, I think that will happen. That is never the difficulty. But for that capital to come, do you think that Greece has the capabilities to manage that wave of REOs? And, and we've discussed a lot of the value chain, but, but from once you repossess it as a, as a servicer, you said someone has to actually go in and do refurbishment on that property. Someone has to manage that invoicing for, for the tenants if it's a rented asset. Someone has to uh, do physical security and, and, and make sure that the uh, land of plot is, is complying with the local regulations and, and we're not sued, right? And someone has to pay taxes uh, on, on a property that we now have. And that's a lot of, and someone has to actually go and sell the, the there has to be a broker that, that sells that asset, right? At, at some point in time when, when, when we believe if it's ready. Um, how comfortable are you with that ecosystem? Do you think that, that from, from what I hear and what I I'm get close, that ecosystem is growing and, and I think people are aware that this, this is coming, but are you comfortable? Do you think there's the need for more people and more uh, professionals to go into that space? Do you think Greece is well covered? What, what are your thoughts on, on that space? Maybe I can answer that. Um, so, uh, it's um, in terms number one in, in terms of the availability of funds that has been priced into the waterfalls, right? So within the waterfalls and within the pricing that we've done as investors, th there are assumptions in terms of what it would cost to uh, mature the real estate property, right? So that we can make it commercial. So that's already built in into the pricing. Of course, it's not putting marble floors in all the properties per se, right? But it, you know, it's reasonable pricing to, to get it in, in a commercial status. So, so that's built in. Now with respect to providers in the market, there are you know, plenty of providers today in the market. And then there, there's the real estate servicing companies that have been created during the last uh, few years, some bigger than smaller. Uh, but, but I think that um, it, it all very much depends on you know, the sheer volume that comes out to market, you know, uh, if it's an avalanche, it's an avalanche and you cannot prepare for it uh, at the end of the day. So I think that uh, it all depends a little bit with, with the timing and it all depends on, on the restructuring versus liquidation strategies that the services are employing. Um, you know, if you forget restructuring and you only do liquidation, obviously you create the, the avalanche. 
if you focus a lot more on restructuring and weight, and, and you're able to also maintain the so-called cumulative collection ratios on, on, on you know, your HAPS performance targets, then you're doing fine. So I think it's, it's a little bit of a balancing effect uh, on how much pressure you put into the system from a NPL servicing perspective. If you put too much pressure in the system, you create the avalanche and no one is prepared to be able to, you know, to, to take care of that. So, so I think it's, it's a good balancing act from an NPL servicing perspective and at the same time in coordination with the real servicer. So the NPL servicer coordinating with the real servicer to ensure that whatever will go out to liquidation can be eventually absorbed, absorbed at the right price as well, matured on time, of course, and commercialized on, on proper time as well. So, um, uh, you know, r right now I believe the market has enough MPL servicers, has enough real servicers, and others who are third parties supporting this ecosystem as well. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and then I think it's, it's the right balance in not, not to create too much pressure into the system. What I worry mostly about is what I was mentioning earlier, is about the bureaucracy in between in trying to get the notary publics to do whatever they need to do, get in the court system, the lawyers, the, you know, whatever governmental agencies are, are there in order to facilitate that process. That is mostly of the concern that I would have than more than anything else. Absolutely. Also, one thing to mention, uh, I guess we're talking about two different scenarios. One is to uh, ARIO, or basically take, take uh, you know, uh, transfer claim into the property for the residential asset. That requires a way different approach, different servicing, different, different strategy. The other is, is, to, is to do that with a, say, ugly industrial asset, which you want to avoid, obviously. Uh, but, I mean, so, it, you know, one has to price differently the, the, those two scenarios. Understood. Um, on, on, I think the, the one point that probably out of all, all of our control, but probably, uh, probably all of us to, to hope that it happens and push for it is, is the part that you were mentioning on making sure that the processes from a legal perspective, from an administrative perspective, uh, simplify. Because again, if, if that big wave, hopefully avoiding a tsunami, but, but, but still a big if you look at those business plans, the amount of, of REOs that are going to come to market is, is significant. Uh, making sure that that is a fluid process is, is going to be very critical for the system to be able to absorb them. Otherwise, we're mm -hmm. going to go into probably a collapse in the, in the administrative side of things. Absolutely. Um, one last topic for us. We have, we have a little bit less than 15 minutes to, to close our session and any Q&A that we want um, to, to have. What are your thoughts for 2022? Um, I think all the, a lot of the big securitizations are either closed or closing, uh, all, all, all in very advanced stage. Uh, there is one big transaction that, has, that is, uh, everyone is, is looking into, which is the Ariadne transaction from PQH. Um, wh what else is, is attracting your interest these days and, and do you think is going gonna, is gonna to be uh, interesting in 2022? Maybe we start with our team of investors and then we expand to our teams of investors plus servicers. Do, do, what, what are you seeing, Johannes? Look, I think for 2022, what, what will be interesting is the mix of portfolios that are coming out because we will obviously have primary uh, market transaction. We, we don't expect that um, to stop, although it will, of course, not be the same level as before. And, but with the secondary um, market transaction, that will be very, very interesting to see because it provides a lot of choice, hopefully, for the investors to take from. And then it's basically coming back to what we said earlier, um, is the pricing um, right on, on, on the secondary market transaction as well, and, but also on the primaries because, as I mentioned, we've learned a little bit our lesson. But in general, um, for 2022, um, I think everyone was expecting a little bit at the beginning of the year that 2021 was already a little bit more active than what we experienced in the end, but now we see that it's really picking up by the end of the year. And basically 2022, um, from our expectation and also hope, is that the mix of primary and secondary will make it interesting. I would very much think the same. I mean, uh, there'll, there'll, obviously there will be a giant transaction if everything goes well. Everyone expected this to be launched. So 
this will basically wipe out the capacity of the advisory market for certain part of, of next year. Yeah. Say, I don't know, big part of uh, Q2 probably, end of Q1. But also it will, it will, it will generate new deals because any, any, any secondary seller wants to, to pick up on the, on the momentum. So uh, I would very much hope that, 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 that it will be a, a, a combination of, of good secondary trades um, as well as uh, I mean the, the large <laughs> trade coming out, maybe some other smaller primary, and maybe REOs finally. Hmm. Victor, what are you yeah. seeing on your side? As I've got very similar views as well. Uh, there are a couple of secondaries that, that will, in the end, they will happen most probably. Uh, whatever the business plan were decided, it, it just makes sense, right? It's common sense that you want to offload the part of the portfolio you're less interested in, you think that somebody else can do it better than you, you can do it, you monetize it, I mean, in general, from an investor perspective. So secondary is definitely. I think what will happen uh, uh, also with the banks is that newer, you know, banks still are generating certain amount of MPLs on an ongoing basis. Those will be, well, what I see from other countries is, is regular sales of more fresh portfolios that are going to the market in a smaller scale, in a smaller packages, but more regular, maybe some forward flow, this type of transaction. Lastly, question mark is on, on COVID generated MPLs, which is, I don't know, hard to assess at the moment. We don't have too much data about that, as far as I know. And we have, I think these are the, the key expectations for and not, not only 2022, but you know, the years after that. I think it's you know the, the fresh MPLs or fresher MPLs that's going to be a, a topic of next years, not next year. Definitely. Understood. Yeah, maybe yeah. Just to to recap what the prior speaker said. So yeah, I, I think 2022 is a year of transition basically. In 2022, you know, after say three to four years of very strong you know movement on NPLs. Uh, and the HAP securitization transactions. I see 2022 where is a year of a last push, if you will, from banks to clean up, you know, continue to clean up their balance sheets down to the, you know, to the teens in terms of uh, NPL ratios, uh, both as final cleanups on whatever is remaining from a HAP securitization perspective, but also from a straight sale perspective of portfolios. So that is going to happen on, on the one end. Of course, yes, Ariadne. Uh, uh, you know, from, from PQH is, uh, is a big trade, the biggest trade uh, um, ever in terms of uh, size of the equity ticket. Uh, so that's, you know, hopefully to materialize within 2022. And, uh, and then the, the initiation, although, yeah, there have been some secondary trades out there that are in, in the process as we speak, the initiation of a, uh, you know, secondary market. Uh, a more stable and ongoing secondary market, both on NPL trades, but also on, on real trades as well. And some of those being born from existing portfolio acquisitions that have been performed in the past, but also from um, half securitizations, uh, you know, in smaller tickets or even single tickets that will be coming out from, from those half securitizations. So it's a year of transition basically in 2022. It's going to be an interesting one, definitely. Um, since we are 10 minutes uh, down, shall we open it to questions from the audience? Yes, please, I think we have a question there and a question there. I, uh, a, a typical question is um, on the uh, Rioco reserves created by the securitization of the Greek market. Uh, do you think the uh, the level will be satisfactory compared to the you know overall amount of uh, of acquisitions that would need to be made by in the process um, and you know uh, it's a standard percentage of outstanding so just to have an idea of whether people think that's enough um, and uh, number two on the uh, on the secondary market acquisitions. Um, do you think it's going to be more of a Ryoko play or is it going to be a loans sales play? Any specific participant from the group or to, should I open it to the panel? Let's start with the Ryoko. Do you think the, the Ryoko loan facilities are big enough? 
It's yeah, a question I hear a lot of times, so it's very The, the Ryoko Reserve facilities are big enough. You know, it's a very good question, uh, Dimitri. You know, this is, you know, when, when you look at the actual waterfall and when you try to, um, you know, price the transaction and see what's there, what's been rated by the rating agency, um, everyone says, yes, it's the right size. It's not too much, it's not too low, it's enough, right? Uh, when you get into the action of actually doing it, uh, I would say that it's uh, really not enough in the sense that you may want to speed up and slow down, speed up and slow down. If you speed up, then you create a problem. If you're slow, you slow down, you don't have a problem. So whenever you need to speed up because of what other market pressures are out there, for example, you know, we've had a market pressure which is very easy. It's COVID, auctions were frozen for a period of time, and now you've got to speed up to make up for lost time. Now that you have to speed up for make up, make up for lost time, you need extra cash. You go to the Ryoko reserves, not enough cash. Or whatever is coming through the waterfall, not enough cash to go into the Ryoko reserves. So hence, you have a minimum amount, or, or, or you have a limitation of what you can go and spend and you can go buy in terms of rios. Otherwise, you create other problems in the Ryoko reserve, like notes not being paid for the investors. And that's a problem for the investors, as you can understand. So. Um, you know, it's not, it's always not enough, right? So it depends. So at the, at the time of pricing, at the time of creation of the structure, it seems enough at a steady space of speed. Whenever you have to speed up, it creates a problem and then you have to find other mechanics to, to, to fix that problem. And that is something that we're actually working on and seeing how we can find, uh, you know, uh, say, funding facilities to sort of fix, you know, provide injections to be able to um, you know, be able to have additional cash whenever you have to uh, speed up in, in, the, in such cases. Excellent. Yeah, which, I mean, ties into the second question, whether there's going to be REO cells or, or, or MPO cells. I mean, some of the, of, I mean, the part of the solution to fund the REOCO is to actively manage the REOCO. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if there are procedural um, delays and basically uh, you cannot pile up enough to, to, to sell, uh, and it's also uh, a factor. I, I would believe that, that, that in the next coming 12 months, uh, this is one of the factors why REO mar uh, markets will be unlocked. Absolutely. When, when we, as advisors, when we work in, 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 those, in those pieces, it's specifically that, that compression of activity that, that destroys the levels of the, of the, of the REO reserves, right? Um, and there's not much more you can do, right? When when something like COVID hits you. Uh... Sorry. In all these cases, uh, the problem. Sorry. In all these cases, the problem had come not necessarily from the actual transaction itself or the amounts for that. It's the uh, you know creation of a perfect storm from all these uh, hubs transactions coming into place and business plans need to be affected at the same time and then. You know, the pile-up, as you said it before, the pile-up of uh, assets to be somehow sorted out, it's going to be huge. So that part of funding is the only thing that, uh, you know, in the market we have not seen it available. I'm sure all investors are making their plans and, you know, organizing themselves towards that. But it will be good to understand what kind of other sources or extra funding would be made available or could be made available in that. Probably two quick thoughts on my side. Um, one of the, we're already seeing conversations on that funding. So I think that will materialize. I think everyone is, this is a topic that's very heavy on the agenda of everyone. So I think that that's something that from what we see will materialize. Please feel free to, to uh, agree or disagree with, with, with that view. But the, the other piece is the liquidation process. There's, a, there's gonna be a lot of things going through the liquidation channel. The liquidation channel has a capacity constraint. That actually plays in favor of being able to uh, meet their uh, Ryoko reserve size, right? Because the system will not be able to process faster. That will help us spread out the, the absorption of REOs. So, so that actually, which is bad in, in essence, uh, having a, a delay in the system, but in this case, it will help out spread out the, the REOs and therefore help that the uh, Ryoko reserves are not uh, reached the limit. There's, there's, there's one thing which I never understood, and that, that I, I don't want to uh, ruin the party, but I mean, when, you know, when 
when the banks are selling and you're assessing the business plans, I mean, if the long-term trend on the market is 95% of the auctions ending up with VDRIOC or 90% of the auctions, then if the business plan is designed at 70-30 or 75-25, it's unrealistic on the onset. So I would hope that that lesson would be learned also the, on the other side and, and the, the, the whole uh, business plan would be structured a little bit differently. I'd argue we could spend a whole day on that percentage of acquisitions as I've had with many. <laughs> um, yes, for, I don't think we have the time, but interesting, very interesting one. I think we had a question here before yeah. and then back. Okay. Um, sure. I'm a foreign investor, let's say and I land in today, and I've been hearing since uh, this morning that the processes, the infrastructure is there in terms of re regulatory and legal environment. The question I would have is typical, and especially for, the, this is probably for, for Agis, what is a typical cycle time for forced sales? Now, voluntary sales, of course, uh, for, for forced sales, what, what would be the average cycle time, especially for residential properties? Sorry, cycle time for what? Cycle time for monetization of assets through the forced sale. Do we have a figure? It used to be two to three years. So Is for residential, for residential or for? Let's say for residential and commercial. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's not easy to, to pinpoint, right? It's definitely, it's definitely improved, definitely improved. You know, and, and basically on, on the assumptions that, w that we're making, and we're trying to take, say, conservative assumptions uh, in, in our business plans, you know, it can take, uh, you know, 12 to 24 months. But then, but then it depends, right, uh, on the different asset type, where the asset is, geographically speaking, the, you, know, where the, um, you know, the quality of the asset itself. The square meters, of course, you know, it's also very, very important, right? If it's a, you know, 400 square meter property, if it's a 100 square meter property. So, you know, we have the so-called marketability. So, you know, so it's, it's not an easy um, answer to give on an average, right? Because, you know, I would be misleading, right? So it depends on very much on marketability, but I would say anywhere between 12 to 24 months is something that you would assume. If you say six months, you'll be very lucky to do it, right? In, in a six month time frame, you'll be very, very lucky if, if impossible, if you will, but 12 months is okay, great, job well done, and 24 months is probably, you know, once you go before the 24 months, then you start to become a little bit more worried. So, you know, somewhere in between. So it's still not, it's improved, but still not stellar, right? Uh, but from an investor to an investor, I would tell you add 50% to whatever people tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and it, by definition, having two times, legal timing and then time to sell. So that's uh, so it's if, uh, for example, the debtor is having a different, uh, one debtor could be different from the other one, right? One would be fighting and prolonging the process by additional requests whatsoever, whereas an easy case, six months, well, that would be perfect, right? <laughs> uh, it's almost like a dream. So I don't think that, um, and it is a very d diverse portfolio. I, I think the, the legal environment, how quickly it's, it, it's developing, this helps a lot. We see in other jurisdictions where similar um, things were introduced, like with the new law, uh, now in here, here in Greece, we'll see how we'll, it will be implemented. But these type of you know, simplifications and automation of the process, sort of, helps a lot in order to, to shorten the timeline. You're not relying that much on, on the capacity of the bottlenecks in the system like courts or you know, processing documents. When the system is more electronic automate, automated, it shortens the, 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 the whole life cycle of this recovery of these cases that are for sale, as you mentioned, to, to quite some extent. It helps to, to expedite the process. And it, it, we'll see how it, work, it will work out. But in other countries, it, I think it was very much useful, and we could see like the the impact, like visibly. I think we had one more question at the back. Hello. Uh, uh, in in terms of what types of secondary sales we may have in portfolios from coming from securitization. Uh, like you said, we'll have um, restructured portfolios that most likely will be bought by banks. 
uh, and also liquid liquidations. Is there an in-between category uh, cases that maybe fail to restructure, but they could restructure? And they, or, or do you think, does the panel think that it's only these two, it's a binary thing, it's either restructuring or liquidation? So, so if I buy a non-restructured sub-portfolio, is it possible that somebody else could restructure things that have not been restructured in the framework of, uh, of the first phase? If, yeah. Uh, you wanna, Go ahead, Artis, uh, please. Uh, yeah, m more than likely, you know, if, if you're going to, and, and, and we haven't gone through the analysis of the exercise yet, right? But this is just um, thinking about it, just, you know, fast forwarding a little bit and, and see what the thought process is going to be. You know, from a servicing perspective, if we prepare a portfolio that is a nicely restructured portfolio, then who's going to pick it up? Yes, it's the banks. That goes to the banks, and they're probably going to pay a good price for it, right? So we put that aside, as we said earlier. Then we're left with what's ever behind in terms of more of an MPL portfolio, and what is the servicer going to do? What, they're going to probably package what's more difficult to be sold, right? But at a fairly... You know, at, you know, I would say market, you know, at a market price, I would say at a lower price than one would expect for someone to pick that up and maybe implement a liquidation strategy for that. So hence, it would be a combination of, say, secured, unsecured, but definitely something that is secured so that someone, an investor that probably specializes in those uh, sort of assets can go in and run through a liquidation strategy. And, and, and execute and not really try to restructure because it's probably, we, you know, we probably have tried to restructure several times and it probably hasn't worked. So, uh, you know, what can we do to, to sell that portfolio would have to be something with that collateral. Otherwise, why would one buy, want to buy something that's, uh, you know, hasn't been, uh, you know, doesn't have a collateral, it's unsecured and the servicer has been able, you know, has been trying to restructure it for several, several years, right? And it hasn't been successful. So it's probably, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's how you package the portfolios eventually, but more than likely it's going to be secure with some collaterals for a liquidation strategy to be applied. Yes, yeah, secured, yes, okay, yes. Um, Johannes, you... I, I think that's exactly that will happen because Let's face it, why are those secondary transactions secondary transactions? Because um, there will be a part of the portfolio that will, that will be sold is most probably the not well-performing part of that portfolio. So, I mean, people intend to, on the secondary market, to, to, to sell the stuff that is not that well-performing. And the magic will be to find exactly those cases in those portfolios that actually can switch. Because, of course, the seller will try to make it a mix, because if you just put too many bad cases together, you need to have something which gives a little bit of an appetite and opportunity to the, to the investor, um, to us, basically. And it will be interesting then to see if we can identify enough cases where we actually can see a turnaround scenario where we can add value, basically, which will then obviously have an impact on the pricing. But I'm, I think you're spot on. It will be definitely a mix um, for sure. I also have to, 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 to look at, at the different asset classes. I mean, reperforming in, in the mortgages is exactly a perfect product for our banks. And, and uh, as Akis pointed out, I mean, the Intrum and, and, and the other big services will be trading hubs pretty much, you know, between the banks to trade their ex-portfolios once reperformed. But on the corporate side, it will be more a difficult case, which were underwritten as, as, as uh, you know, under, which were originally uh, claimed as, as, um, as uh, a restructuring play, but it's not. So these will be sold to accelerate cash flows and to, to basically bring the business plan closer. On but, the then. but I think it gives also a good opportunity for specialized services. I mean, we are here in the investor panel, but I think when we look at the business plans for those especially secondary trades where maybe those inferior parts of the original portfolios they we need to find a workout situation then let's face it all the major services are doing i think a quite good job on average but you know no one is perfect and there most probably are enough um, specialized services that can add that value and turn specific cases ex exactly and that will that will give opportunities and the volume is there, right? And so the there, there is, this is an important component. You can be a specialized, but you need to have enough like, uh, volume to, to build your business plan on. Yeah. So yeah, that makes sense. I mean, like, this is carving out, and we see it in other countries as well, right? Where you have uh, specific 
even secured or you know, corporate secured or unsecured specialized buyers who are targeting certain sub-segments. And it, it might be the other way around that the buyers are seeking for these opportunities, right? The, the right ones obviously want to be ahead of the crowd. Excellent. Services and investors? Uh, I, I meant uh, the comment on the, on the investors uh, in, in general, looking for these type of niches, right? It's, uh, and, and this will create, obviously, in one and the other is, is, is a component uh, working together in the end, right? So uh, a component of one whole. You've, you've got a servicer who, pro who will provide you the service you want to get, and you've got the money. Who, usually, usually this is the, 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 the mix of, of this type of niche plays on the market. And this will, as the market will mature more and more, and there will be, you know, um, less of, a, of a, the regular volumes, you know, pe people will start to look at, you know, where can do better than the others. And like the in initial comment, like you might not be the, the right person to, you cannot assume you can do everything the best on the planet, right? There are people who might be better than you on certain sub-segments or sub niche pools, and this could create opportunities. It's not going to be a huge market, like uh, the primary sales, of course, but this will be the development of, uh, of the coming years, I think. Excellent. And you can see a trend on, on other matured markets, like in Italy, or, or you know, where, where you have a specific niche sub-portfolios being sold, for example. Uh, absolutely. I'm going to conclude here, our panel. We are 10 minutes past our time. Um, apologies or, or thank you for staying with us. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure and I think we will all see each other in the market in the, in the following months.